role, which incorporates educating about health effects of climate change and emergency preparedness to learners and to build and strengthen an agile and informed community around climate and health education, advocacy, and policy for health professionals with a strong mentorship and expert support. What you need to keep in mind throughout the present presentation is the question, how do you apply this in your position? As an example, in my position as a medical epidemiologist and public health consultant, consultant who teaches my role is to help you. Well, I've lost my. It's to help you learn the skills and develop the attitudes to fulfill your role, to advocate and to develop policy about climate change. When I was an MPH student a few years ago, I won't say how long, um, the climate indirectly related public health issue of the time um, was about the hole in the ozone layer. The solution to healing the ozone hole was guided by the Montreal Protocol to decrease chlorophor fluorocarbons, CFCs, but hydrochlorocarbons, HFCs, replace the CFCs. HFCs cause increase in greenhouse gases. However, as climate change is uh, much bigger than the issue of HFCs, um, the issue we're going to discuss is um, larger than the ozone layer. Um, so you have to think about how you're going to apply this information in the context of your work. This presentation is about climate change and water and foodborne diseases and in equipping you for that role. Let's see slides. At the end of the presentation, you should be able to explain how changes to the hydrologic cycle may impact on patient health and the steps health professionals can take to reduce the risk posed by the changes having described and applied the knowledge of climate hydrological change related to waterborne and foodborne diseases and their impacts on health. And we have brief explorations of specific diseases relevant to the Caribbean. In addition, you will learn about the link between climate change and food security, diet, one health, and the specific health responders, the specific steps health responders can take to reduce risk posed by climate change at both the individual and community levels. These are vast learning areas in themselves. So the presentation serves to introduce you to the material. It's a teaser really for you to go deeper into how you can become a climate change health responder. Right, um, these are some definitions uh, you will uh, be, I'll be using in the presentation. Um, climate change, so I've defined it, significant changes in global temperature, precipitation, wind patterns, and other measures of climate that occur over several decades or longer. I've used um, sort of plain English definitions um, because I figured it would be easier uh, for you to understand um, the technical, if you want the more technical definitions, when the references are completed, you'll find them in the references. Climate vari variability, on the other hand, talks about the aspects of climate, such as temperature and precipitation, and how they differ from an average. Um, and I have a slide after which will show you the difference. The hydrosphere is the component of the climate system composed of the liquid surface and subterranean water, such as ocean, seas, rivers, freshwater lakes, underground water, water vapor. 
um, and the hydrologic cycle is the process by which that water moves around the earth. Um, the cycle includes evaporation, precipitation, runoff, con con condensation, transpiration, and infil infiltration. Um, I've gone through it so that you, ha in hearing what it's about, hopefully it will help you um, uh, not have to think about it as I talk about them as we go along. So just to um, graphically distinguish between climate variability and climate change. The first um, picture on the left of your screen, um, I'm afraid the numbers don't show up very clearly. The, clearly the picture did not, um, was not very good in the document itself. That uh, shows uh, climate variability. The temperature fluctuates around a uh, mean value. Most of the others are, are uh, they have both variability as well as climate um, change in it. Um, so in the, um, the one right next to it, you see the um, changes um, varying, but it's also increasing. Um, and that's um, just the difference between those two. So this is a map of the Caribbean. It shows the change in sea surface temperature from 1982 to 2016. As can be seen, the change in the surface temperature in most of the Caribbean islands, uh, English-speaking Caribbean islands, um, varies at increases or changes by 0 0.04 per year for most of the islands. In the Caribbean, we are blessed with populations of vibrant, colorful, creative people living in a region of the world that is envied by many. But we also live in a region um, which experiences the effects of climate change on a daily basis. Last week, you explored the health-related impacts of hurricanes on the region um, and climate change. This week, we are looking at water and foodborne disease. Climate change and climate variability associated with the changes in temperature. Hold on a second. I think I... Yeah. And precipitation patterns may result in primary effects in the short term in the short term due to extreme events very familiar to the region, hurricanes. Less commonly highlighted is the now more familiar site and occurrences of floods and on the other extreme drought in the Caribbean. Apart from the devastation caused in all these extreme events, um, issues of injury, loss of life also occur. Um, or you have secondary uh, effects due to pollution and damage to the environment or tertiary or more long-term effects such as malnutrition and chronic disease. The events in themselves, especially um, in relation to hurricanes, may destroy infrastructure, ecobiological systems and structures and livelihoods. Destroying crops may contaminate the environment and may result in increased exposure to pathogens and other human exposures that cause waterborne and foodborne diseases. This was um, uh, taken from one of the papers um, that I asked you to have a look at, and it was really because of this document, this diagram. So what I've done is I've used um, I've used pictures that are easy to read. I thought that would be helpful. Um, the climate system, to discuss climate and climate change and health, you need to understand the, um, what climate is. So we're starting in the middle, not at the beginning. We were not here when the story began. We are in the middle, we are here now. To understand climate change, first there's a climate system comprising all the spheres, 
These are just the water-related ones. You also have biospheres, the biosphere and the geosphere. Um, but these are the water-related ones. So all the hydrosphere talks to all the water on the planet that can be stored in the oceans, glaciers, rivers, streams, groundwater, or water vapor. It's everything. Um, uh, it also takes account of the movement of the water, moving the heat in the water around the globe. That's what this picture is about, the currents that move that hot water. In climate change, you have a global web of relationships. In epidemiology, you wouldn't remember about the causal web of, co um, of the web of causation. The climate change seems to have a web of relationships as well. Um, it talks about uh, uh, movement of matter and energy constantly occurring between the spheres. And in climate change, what happens is that because uh, in the past these changes occurred over long periods, what those changes are now happening in climate change over very short periods of time. And that's where the problem um, occurs. This is a very busy diagram. There's absolutely no way I can go through everything that's in it. But I wanted you to just look at the fact that you have the um, hydrological cycle in one part at the top here, um, and then it talks to the hydrosphere because we're dealing with water, um, but it gives you everything that happens it, from the cold um, glaciers, um, which we don't have in the Caribbean, but it affects us. We have the volcanoes, um, but it just gives you an idea that many of the things that affect climate change are beyond the borders of the Caribbean, and there's very little we can do about it. But we feel the effects every day as a person living in the Caribbean. This is the hydrosphere from the point of view of the Caribbean. You see our little um, uh, uh, coconut tree. Um, it, this describes the implications for the water and um, uh, water availability, equality, and supply we're going to look at. To better understand the changes resulting in health effects, we will examine how climate change impacts on the hydrosphere and affects what these three um, issues. The hydrosphere in the Caribbean is the component of the climate system composed of the liquid surface and subterraneous waters, as, I, um, as you see here. Uh, the cycle, the hydrologic cycle, is about how the water moves around. Um, uh, transpiration is the evaporation of water from plants occurring at the leaves while their stomata are open for the passage of carbon dioxide and ox oxygen during photosynthesis. With climate change, there are higher rates of evaporation. What happens, what this, what happens as a result of this is that warm, dry areas are likely to become drier. And so you will have water scarcity in those areas. And some areas are likely to experience longer dry seasons in the Caribbean. Also in climate change, you have increase in precipitation um, and increase in precipitation intensity. Higher temperatures increase evaporation rates. More water vapor in the atmosphere results in an overall global increase in precipitation. But this varies from region to region. So in some areas, more there's more rainfall, and in other areas, um, less. When rain does fall, uh, events are likely to be intense due to the higher amounts of water vapor in the atmosphere. 
So you have high in then intensity rain events. In these, it means the intense rain events lead to more surface runoff. More surface runoff means less infiltration, less groundwater, and more flooding. This is compounded by site characteristics such as um, paved surfaces. Another uh, uh, area of climate change is sea level rise. Higher sea levels lead to salt water intrusion in wells and aquifers near the coastline. And so you have a reduction in the supply of groundwater. Better understand the changes resulting in health effects. We will examine how climate change impacts on the hydrosphere and affects water availability, quality, and supply. The hydrosphere is the component of the climate system com composed of the uh, water throughout the system. I copied this twice. Um, I wrote the wrong thing. An integrated water resource management approach for building climate resistance, resilience in Caribbean water sector. Um, you will Yeah, I don't know what happened there. So there's less available water for domestic industrial or agricultural use due to the less rainfall. And you have lower volumes of water in reservoirs and water and rivers. So you have an alteration in the timing of the rainfall. And as I said, um, intense rainfall, you have more surface runoff and, and less infiltration. As regards water quality, pollutants in water courses include fertilizers, pesticides, municipal wastewater, with higher evaporation rates um, and less water because of evaporation. It means pollutants become more concentrated and the implications for water abstraction um, and recreational use result from this. In heavy rainfall events, pollutants may become diluted. It depends on the level of the pollution in the water body com compared to the level of pollution in the watershed. Um, so you have, and as well, heavy surface runoff can increase pollutant levels dependent on that interaction between those two. So this is the first poll question. Climate change predictions forecast for, forecasts for the Caribbean include in the main Caribbean basin, which is where um, most of the islands, uh, the English speaking islands lie, it'll be drier. Um, you will have drier and a longer dry season with drought. Or when rain falls, you have heavy downpours with floods. Or four, all of the above. Is Haley going to give us the all on that? How does this work? Yeah, one second. I'm just waiting for the results to roll in. Um, I'm looking at one screen, and it's only when I look down at the other one. And I scroll. All right. All of the above. Yes. All of the above. Thank you. Okay. Um, no.
right. So this is the answer. So um, the main Caribbean basin is drier. You have possible wetter conditions in the Northern Caribbean. You have drier and longer dry seasons. The Caribbean region, the primary rainy season, May to November can become significantly drier. And uh, you have an expected overall decrease in annual precipitation of about 12% for the Caribbean region. When rain fall, when rain does fall, you have heavy downpours, downpours and you have more intense hurricanes. Because there's less water available, some countries who now have hydropower uh, sources of energy, um, they now have decreased access to the hydropower because there is less water available in the system. There may be a wide range of health outcomes to climate change, as you can see from the slide. The slide illustrates the most significant climate change impacts. You have rising temperatures, more extreme weather, rising sea levels, and increasing carbon dioxide levels. They, they, effect, they have an effect on the exposures and the subsequent health outcomes that can result from the changes in the exposures. Where the focus of this presentation, we are going to be dealing with food and water related health impacts. So we're using a broad definition of waterborne and foodborne disease. Um, we are going to explore the relationship with climate change in two parts. We're going to look at infectious or toxin waterborne and foodborne diseases. And then we look at foodborne non-communicable or chronic disease. So waterborne disease, water and foodborne diseases um, can be due to pathogens, bacteria, virus, protozoa, um, helminins, um, and they are spread by consumption or exposure to contaminated water and food. What I've done is adapted a WHO um, definition because the WHO had them separate and I've put them together. Waterborne diseases are responsible for 1.5 million deaths globally. This was in 2012. 58% of that burden is in low and middle income countries. So you have almost um, 900,000 deaths per year. Um, and it's attrib attributable to unsafe water supplies or inadequate sanitation and lack of hygiene. When you link that to the uh, hydrologic cycle, uh, it means climate impacts on the incidents and the case examples, we are going to look at um, following this slide will be those that are relevant to the Caribbean. Um, with climate change uh, and heavy precipitation events are projected to occur more frequently. And so waterborne uh, diseases and outbreaks, um, which are affected by precipitation, 
um, would be uh, more frequent as well. This slide shows the occurrence of um, the major uh, waterborne and foodborne uh, pathogens in the Caribbean from 2005 to 2016. Salmonella was the most common, commonly reported um, organism. Uh, this is through a laboratory system. Cigatera is the second most common. However, in the Caribbean, Cigatera is a clinical diagnosis. Testing for Cigatera is only available, um, I think, in Florida or maybe in Puerto Rico. So Salmonella accounted for the largest number of cases with an average of 564 cases per year, peaking at 798 in 2010 and falling to a low of 297 in 2016. The highest numbers recorded were between 2016 and 20, 2013 and 16 were in Guyana, um, and were in Guyana, Bermuda, Barbados, and Belize. That data is not shown. The Cigatera cases uh, resulting from fish poisoning averaged 328 cases per year, ranging from 205 in 20. 09 to 444 in 2013, with 427 cases in 2014. Cases of typhi uh, fell dramatically from 805 in 2005, that's the pink, um, and to six in 2008, and thereafter did not exceed seven in every year. Um, and Shigella and Campylobacter um, accounted for a similar number of cases. Right, so these are the um, uh, diseases we are going to briefly go through in relation to uh, the effects of climate change and the, how the hydrologic system impacts on the occurrence of these diseases. So for salmonella, as you are aware, it um, can cause gastroenteritis. You have nausea and vomiting with diarrhea. Within the hydrologic system, the water can become contaminated through fecal pollution by infected humans, but also by other invertebrates. Incidence of salmonella, salmonella can increase with warming waters. Norovirus, um, also causes acute gastroenteritis in humans. So the symptoms are projectile vomiting. You have watery, non-bloody diarrhea with abdominal cramps and myalgia. And heavy rainfalls and flooding increases the infections. In order to uh, control or prevent, uh, it means, uh, and protect yourself from um, norovirus, uh, washing hands, washing fruit, cooking shellfish thoroughly, cleaning surfaces, and washing laundry. When you're sick, don't be, prepare food or care for others. Direct impacts of on Campylobacter you have symptoms which are again similar, water, but you have watery, bloody diarrhea. Um, you have abdominal pain, fever, headache, nausea. These are associated with increased air and water temperature and heavy precipitation.
With cryptosporidium, again, you have watery diarrhea that can be severe and even life-threatening. These are due to sturdy oocysts, oocysts which, um, where chlorination is ineffective. The small size of the organism means filtration is also ineffective. Heavy rainfall causes mobilization of the oasis leading to outbreaks. And this is the, the cycle of uh, the organism. Uh, so it's um, phaco oral, uh, and uh, as you um, shed it, it means it gets back into the system. And if there's a break in the system or the system is overwhelmed and uh, it uh, is able to escape the sewage system, it will then um, uh, cause outbreaks in, uh, in the community. For Vibrio cholera, you have acute diarrhea that can kill within hours. This is the um, rice colored diarrhea. Highly contagious, um, most present in Africa and Asia where there's poor infrastructure. Um, it was introduced, it's on the mainland of uh, South America. Um, but most of the islands were free from cholera until it was introduced into Haiti with the um, uh, introduction by workers who came to help after the um, earthquake. Uh, with respect to climate change, um, and the El Nino cycle, it's wet, wetter in East Africa, and you have um, less rain in dry areas, would then lead to unsafe drinking. More rain in dry areas would have flooding of sewer systems. Less rain in wet areas would decrease flooding, and more rain in wet areas decrease path pathogens. Um, concentration, but increased flooding. Uh, as well, uh, the phytoplankton blooms um, can provide good habitats for the survival and spread of cho cholera um, in waters, in sea waters or Other Vibrio are also present in um, coastal waters uh, uh, in the summer or early autumn. With increasing ocean temperature, you have in and you have increasing al algal booms, you have increasing concentrations of um, these organisms. You have higher minimum temperatures and uninterrupted growth. Uh, these organisms can cause septicemia of wounds as well as gastrointestinal symptoms. So the other paper you had to look at was the, um, addressing leptospirosis in Guyana. So leptospirosis is usually transmitted through contact with water or soil contaminated with urine from infected animals. In severe flooding, it can put individuals at greater risk for contracting leptospirosis in endemic areas. And that's what happened in Guyana. What was important um, in that episode was the post-event surveillance um, was able to uh, further limit the occurrence. It also allowed uh, the um, uh, health workers who were managing the um, outbreak um, became more familiar with making the diagnosis of leptospirosis 
the systems to support the, the process of managing and caring for persons and the surveillance of persons with leptospirosis improved um, the management of floods as related to um, the occurrence of leptospirosis became more apparent to the wider population. And so um, that would help in further uh, control with other uh, flood events or water related events. So in cigarette terror poisoning, Symptoms usually appear one to three hours after consuming contaminated fish. The, the fish are actually contaminated from uh, the, the consumed smaller fish who have uh, uh, consumed the cigatoxin and they concentrate it. So it means big fish. Uh, um, what caused the problem. Uh, the symptoms can vary from abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Um, and three to 72 hours later, um, you can get neurological complications, tingling, of sens tingling sensation, temperature reversal, cold items feel hot, hot items feel cold. You can also get itching a metallic taste in the mouth, feeling like teeth are loosening, blurred vision, and even temporary blindness. And these symptoms usually last for several weeks. Long-term, you can get chronic fatigue, depression, muscle pain, headache, a slow or irregular heartbeat and bradycardia, and low blood pressure. And that can be maintained for a very long time. This is a, a, a toxin that when you get exposed more than once, um, it stays in your system. And so exposure puts you at risk to getting the more long-term effects of it. There may be a seasonal variation observed in the Caribbean with the overgrowth due to rising temperature. Increased water temperatures and you have um, nutrient runoff with heavy precipitation events, um, as well as ocean upwelling events, something as simple as dragging an anchor or a of a large ship over a reef may be all it takes to um, cause a problem. So what these diseases um, can occur in droughts or when there's precipitation increase or when the water temperature increases. What this slide shows is gives it gives you the risk. Sorry. I was trying to turn off the phone. Um, right, so this uh, slide uh, gives you, uh, it talks to the climate change events um, and the risk, um, the microbial risk associated um, with the different organisms. So with um, precipitation increase, it means you have runoff sediment, organic matter, nutrients, peak concentrations of pathogens in surface water, flooding of wells, storm water runoff, and combined sewage overflow. What essentially happens is you have a mixing of all these um, waters. So it, it, it ends up with the water that you drink may end up having water from your sewage system because of the situation related to the precipitation increase. Um, in that situation, it means um, water treatment is at risk, and so you have increased risk, uh, microbial risk. Um, so that's how you read the slide. In water temperature increase, you have um, replication of the marine bacteria, with, for example, the Vibrio. Um, 
in uh, you have die off of enteric pathogens, um, example, norovirus and campylobacter. Um, organic matter and nutrients dissolve better. Uh, you have lower concentrations of pathogens in surface water, which would decrease microbial risk. risk. But if you have challenges of the water treatment and it's less efficient, then the risk will increase. And so it moves from one to the other in, in parts. In drought, you have changes in water sources and you have concentration of pathogens. When you have changes in water sources you, and you have insufficient treatment options of the water um, that is being used, um, potable water, you end up with increased risk. And with this, with concentration of pathogens, you also end up with con um, increased risk. So th this is a comparison or um, just a slide that uh, summarizes the presentations um, uh, of the Vibrio, which, is, which can uh, occur in the Caribbean the protozoa, the cyclospora, and cryptosporidium, how you can get it, what the agents are, um, uh, how it actually gets to those agents in the first place, um, through the groundwater for um, shellfish virus, um, recreational water for the um, cyanobacteria and dinoflagets, and um, the indirect weather effect, um, you have enhanced zooplankton blooms. Um, and the direct weather effect is the salinity and the temperature associated with growth in um, the marine environment. So you just read straight across the slide for all of them. With storms, when storms increase the transport of fecal and wastewater um, sources and the temperature is associated with um, maturation and infectivity of the cyclospora and causes disease. Essentially, you have uh, um, what happens is you have an imbalance in the relationship between the agent host and environment, and uh, the host loses because the host gets ill. And that's the epidemiologic triad. So what needs to happen from the perspective of um, your role as the uh, uh, climate change responder is you have to translate uh, the focus of the information that you were given um, into action. Um, uh, from the perspective of using the uh, epidemiologic triad, which I just briefly mentioned, which is host, agent, and environment, you are dealing with um, uh, persons, plants, animals, um, and the interaction between them. Uh, and so uh, from the perspective of identifying who the health climate change um, health responder is, um, the definition of that health professional um, may need to be wider than um, a doctor or a nurse um, and incorporate all the members of a One Health team, um, uh, which incorporates the environment as well as animals um, uh, to facilitate a wider action to uh, implement control and prevention measures. Also, many of our populations are living on low-lying islands or mainland countries, some already at sea level. Uh, so it means uh, resilience, which is what these um, frameworks um, talk to, building resilience against climate effects. Um, the first one is the original developed by the CDC, and the second um, is an adaptation, um, taking on board um, the community uh, connections as well as the natural resource security, cultural use of the information and um, uh, implementing uh, education and self 
determination and resilience um, informed by these. So resilience may not be enough in our setting from the point of view of we are in the middle of it already. The Caribbean is experiencing climate change and its effect on health um, and has been um, doing so for a while. Um, and so what uh, we may need is a transformative um, action um, uh, by the populations. Um, resilience is a start, um, but then you need to um, move past um, that. Right, so in talking about the um, individual diseases, I try to identify um, how you decrease um, uh, individual, the risk of for individual vulnerability. Um, in addition to uh, what I presented for each of um, the diseases, um, individual promotion, health promotion practices um, in each of diseases uh, um, will inform um, lowering the risk of individual vulnerability. In addition, at community level, it means um, the health promotion would focus at um, improving hygienic practices depending on the disease um, and the need for cooking and um, uh, cooking well and using clean water and issues like that would need to be addressed. Um, uh, not eating food and vegetables after a flooding event where um, they were exposed to the flood waters um, is another practice that can be uh, used by communities. It's sort of a, 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 a sort of middle of the road between community and individual um, because individuals will do it, but it means health promotion um, to support uh, communities would be um, giving these messages at the same time. Um, for Sigaterra, it means um, at a community level, you would have to encourage a change of practice in regard to eating certain fish at certain times of the year. And so you are avoiding um, eating reef fish that are over six pounds um, from a large fish. And that's very difficult in the Caribbean because we eat a lot of fish. Um, and then the other part is not to eat the liver and intestines, heads, um, um, especially of smaller reef fish, because that's where the um, uh, toxin would be um, concentrated. So this is the second um, poll question. In achieving the course objective to improve patient care and public health practice and serve as the health community's trusted messengers within your institution, communities, and fields of practice, how do you envisage your role as a One Health professional in participating in the implementation of response actions to the climate change crisis in the Caribbean? Let me just shorten that. How do you see what, how do you see that you will fulfill your role? Will you be an advocate? One, will you be developing interventions, implementing interventions, be an educator, all of the above or none of the above? All of the above. Good, good mix. And that's because we have a good mix of um, different occupations. And so you will all function within the occupation um, that you are. Thanks.
Right. So when we're looking at um, chronic diseases and nutrition in relation to um, climate change, these are the areas we're going to just briefly go through. Um, climate change and the nutrition pathway, the definitions. We look at food security and the link between undernutrition and household food access, and then mitigating climate change um, and um, nutrition, the link between the two. This is just um, some definitions. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, I will say uh, we're going to look at a wide definition of undernutrition. So undernutrition would, um, in our context, include both malnutrition as well as obesity. Um, and uh, we will um, deal with that um, in a later slide. So the nutrition pathway situates um, uh, climate-related malnutrition and nutrition-related non-communicable diseases. I'm not sure whether this is um, uh, uh, displaying adequately, but I will just talk you through part of it um, because it's the malnutrition, which is the pink um, square at the top, um, which we're trying to get to. And we're starting from the um, enabling or disabling environment at the bottom, which is the changes in temperature, rainfall, loss of biodiversity, economic, um, economic growth becomes less sustainable. This is the imbalance um, in the uh, environment, which then um, uh, affects the food environment. You have changes in food availability, quality, and access. Um, due to the sea level rise um, and climate change. Um, and it affects all the environments as you're going straight across. These then impact on the health behavior of the individual. Um, so their diet choices may change, um, as well as their disease status may change. And that will influence um, their nutrition status in the long way, in the long term. Um, on top of that, it means you may have mitigating actions that are occurring as well as adaptation. Um, and those will um, then impact and may um, uh, improve the environment. And then um, that's how that um, pathway works. So briefly, um, this is dealing with the greenhouse gases, um, uh, which are created uh, by the um, uh, breakdown of um, uh, carbon, um, the increase, increase in carbon dioxide and methane, you have the um, decreasing chlorofluorocarbons and the hydrofluorocarbons, um, nitrous oxide as well. Um, but it uh, affects um, physiological processes. This is the part here. Um, so you have photosynthesis, respiration, growth, and um, water use. That's in plants as well as animals. Um, the climate change here, you have increase in temperature, increase in, in um, precipitation, um, and all the uh, uh, relevant uh, parts of climate change. And the increased carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases affects both. Uh, and then these then go down, so you have changes in species interactions, um, and then you have changes. So you have uh, you lose biodiversity, um, as well as uh, the imbalance of the gases um, they are, are further uh, compromised. This was a picture I thought was. When I first looked at it, I said, well, what is so strange? We have a lot of tanks here. This is a picture from Trinidad and Tobago. And then I looked at it again, and then I realized that this is a tank in a field to provide water to the plants or crop that this person, this farmer is growing. 
So it has become um, so uh, dry, he has to provide tank water um, uh, to his, his um, crops. Um, so climate change affects um, food security. Um, it disrupts the stability of the supply of food. Um, this is this person's livelihood um, is now um, more difficult. Uh, and income from uh, food um, is, uh, which he's producing is less. Um, you then have on top of that, um, heavy rains followed by heavy, um, by high temperatures can also promote bacterial and fungal growth. So um, food can be not usable. Um, okay, what happened there? Did it slip? Okay. Right. So how does this then affect um, the wider picture of undernutrition? So the concept of undernutrition and obesity and climate change have been um, uh, put together and uh, can be uh, found in the literature under the term syndemic, uh, where it's uh, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? They all occur at the same time. They are simultaneous pandemics um, of chronic diseases, as well as the, if you want to term it, um, a crisis of climate change. Um, and the climate change would affect food production and availability, access, quality, utilization, and the stability of the food system destroying crop yields and stocks, extreme weather um, related disasters um, uh, are increasing and then it would reduce the yield of major crops. And then you have high levels of carbon dioxide reducing the nutritional value of crops. Um, together with this, you may have a combination of um, spikes in food prices, reduced incomes, disruption of trade and transport, damage to market infrastructures, um, and um, it will hinder vulnerable persons accessing food uh, and leading to poor quality and less diversity in um, diets. These are some of the factors that um, affect the individual vulnerability. If you do not have funds to do what needs to be done to sustain living, it means nothing else can happen. Um, and so this uh, diagram um, uh, speaks to the fact that you have, on top of everything else that's happening, uh, you have uh, financial um, stressors um, because many of the times um, these vulnerable groups um, are on inf informal systems um, and in climate change situations, it means the informal systems may break down. So given that that's um, maybe an issue, how do you actually um, address that? So mitigating climate change um, may impact on uh, the diets that persons are able uh, to have um, to address the issue of the syndemic, you have to address all the components. Um, it's both systematic and individual. Um, we can deal with it in the um, uh, discussion. Um, that nice word file that's showing there might be a bit too complicated to get at. Um, but given that in climate change, um, research has shown that a dietary change towards increased adoption of plant-based diets um, actually has much stronger mitigating potential to limit global warning, warn, warming to less than a two degree increase, as well as changes in food production 
practices can reduce agricultural greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, by about 10% um, by 2050. Um, as well, uh, increased consumption of plant-based diets could reduce emissions by up to 80%. Um, Dr. Boonkin? Yes. Yes. I come in. I come in to come. We'll fly through this. We've already seen this, so I don't need to speak to it. Um, this is speaking to the fact that um, to uh, provide uh, finances to persons who are in vulnerable populations, you have to create systems. And then on top of that, you have community level um, uh, actions that can be taken um, uh, to transform uh, uh, systems that support vulnerable populations. So you have food fortification, um, changing food systems so that you use clean energy, um, creating climate smart um, production of crops and communities and all that entails. This is the last question, and it closes the thing. Given your envisaged role in relation to food and waterborne diseases and climate change in the Caribbean, can you identify one action you can take when you get back to work um, tomorrow to start your journey to decrease the impact of climate change on food -borne and waterborne diseases in your jurisdiction? write it in one line, and I think somebody will tell you where to write it. Is that somebody going to say that? Haley? Haley? Oh, sorry, everyone, put your answers in the, in the chat for that last question. Um, and so this is just the closing slide. So what I went through was the hydrosphere and the hy hy hydrological cycle and climate change. Um, infectious and pathogens, infectious pathogens and toxins and waterborne and water and foodborne related disease and climate change in relation to your role as a climate change health responder and then chronic um, uh, diseases um, in relation to water and foodborne and climate change, again, in relation to you as a um, climate change responder. And I think I forgot to write, thank you. So the, the references are not complete. I will have to complete the references and make a, um, a more complete um, reference list available. Um, in this slide set that is um, uploaded because it's many more references than six. Thank you. Okay, great. So thank you very much, Dr. Boon Ging, for the so your talk. I close this now? Yes, you can. Very good. And I have to stop, stop sharing. Yeah, you've, you've, you stopped sharing. All right. So we're going to move into the discussion portion of the evening. We have a few questions um, to ask you. So the first question comes from Audrey Rope. Audrey, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Apologies if I'm not. So Audrey is saying that overall, there's a decrease in the annual precipitation in the Caribbean. And she's just wondering if that's also the case in Suriname. Um, do you have any knowledge of this? I would not be able to see detail at an individual country level, no. That may be information that's available through the CIMH. They may have more detailed information at country level, I'm not sure. Sure. Right, so our second question comes from Gary Joseph. And he has a question related to cholera. So you mentioned some statistics um, on cholera, and he's just wondering if those statistics also included the epidemic, the cholera epidemic that occurred in Haiti um, between 2010 and 2016. 
I um that data I think was up to 2012, so it may have, may have had the 2010 data, but all the cholera that's occurring in Haiti is related to the introduction of cholera um, after the um, earthquake because most of the islands were clear of cholera. Um, they, you had cholera on the mainland, um, South America, um, because of the um, transfer of cholera, cholera, I forget what year it was, um, there was a dumping of um, uh, wastewater from uh, the, bil the bilge of a boat in the waters in Peru. And that started, that brought the, the Vibrio cholera to the, the Americas. It was not in South America before that. Right. That may have been in the 80s. Right, okay. Um, so in keeping with this, the, the same theme of cholera, we also have a question from Carlo, who is wondering if you're aware of any data um, on Vibrio species in recreational waters. Do you know of any the incidents? Um, I don't know the incidents. I know what is, um, they are actually, many countries have started doing measurements in, um, uh, recreational waters. I don't know um, the level of that measurement. Um, the, you normally look um, in recreational waters for uh, um, its coliforms as well as there's another term. I can't remember it. Um, and so uh, I'm not sure how the measurement, the measurement of Vibrio may be limited um, to what's called event-based, as in you have a case. Um, and so it may be that you have a case, um, you have, because you have a case, you then um, look at your syndromic surveillance. Is there anything happening in syndromic surveillance? If something is happening there, then you um, check the labs. Is anything happening there? And so it's a, a sort of um, going from one to the other and trying to link them and get it that way. Um, but I can't see um, if they look specifically for Vibrio. I would have to check that and get back to you. Great, yeah, we appreciate that. Um, okay, so moving along, we have a question from Christopher Singh. So Christopher is actually asking about the relationship between temperature, drought and chronic diseases, specifically diabetes. So he's saying that temperature changes can trigger somebody's susceptibility to develop diabetes. And he's just wondering if there is any data in the Caribbean that suggests if we're facing long periods of drought, does that increase our incidence of gestational diabetes or just diabetes in general? I, you, I can't, I can't say, no. Yeah. No. Uh, Christopher, we there have... Is, I, I'm not sure whether the person who's going to do heat... Yes. Um, ...would deal with that. Yeah. So that's our next lecture next week. So you may um, be able to get some more information on that on heat-related illnesses next week. And Christopher has another question. So this question... He's asking about the use of climate data in the Caribbean region and how far has the region come in using climate data to monitor the incidence of water and foodborne diseases? Um, I think that I, I think James might be able to help with this because I, I think um, there's a CM, CIMH person doing a presentation later. Yes. James? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Poon King. Yeah, there will be later in the course a CIMH presentation, which will focus on air quality and dust. Um, it's a good question. And CIMH and CARFA and PAHO are putting out a climate and health bulletin. Yeah, because I is, looked at that for this presentation. Which is beginning to unpack more and more of these correlations. Uh, sometimes we you know, we we weren't seeing them until you start to look and ask the questions. 
claim it affects this and then it affects something else and it affects something else. And it's an interconnected system, as Dr. Punky was saying a few times. You really have to keep your minds open of how this could happen uh, in, in, in a interconnected way over. I had a look at the, the most recent of those bulletins um, before I completed the presentation. Uh, so the most recent bulletin um, spoke to um, what you do in drought and how what may happen from drought um, because different islands are, are in different um, states of um, response um, as, as regards climate change and what's happening. So some islands have been experiencing drought. I mean, I can't, I can't say when was the last time you had a complete water um, service in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I don't know how different it is in the rest of the Caribbean, but if, if, if I say um, my memory may be as a child, <laughs> I don't think that's being any far reach. It may be as long as that. That's all right. Uh, I think, yes, we'll certainly get some more information on it from the uh, CIMH lectures that will be coming up. So please tune in for those to get some more information on it. Uh, so moving along, we have another question from Venu Sibarat Misa. Are you aware of any evidence for uh, increased mosquito related diseases like dengue or Zika after heavy periods of rainfall in the Caribbean. I think someone's going to be doing vector borne diseases, but it usually follows. Right, um, right. But I won't speak to vector borne diseases. Um, in relation to water, what happens is because you try to collect water and you may do it unsafely, you end up. Um, uh, 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 making a problem relating to vector bone because the water is stored incorrectly. Right. Okay. Um, the next question is from Celia Victor. Is there any data in the Caribbean which tells us the best way to treat portable water prior to or after um, the hurricane season? to sort of mitigate against any possible infections? I don't, I don't know. That would be, I would have to check that because I, I'm not sure what systems there are available to have that information. One available to the public. Right. Um, so it may be part of the, um, you know, when, when uh, the rains are coming, they say you need to get this pack ready. Um, that's your response pack. So it may be part of that. I don't know. Okay, sure. Right. So we have a question from Damien Bastio, and this one is on heavy metals. Um, do you suspect heavy metal poisoning from contaminated foods, example, seafood? Um, do you think this will occur more frequently in the coming years in the Caribbean? Um, that's really a bit out, out of the scope of this, but it may do it because it, it, um, heavy metals are concentrated in fish right. and it's the same thing. The smaller fish are eaten by the big fish. So the bigger the fish you eat, the higher the concentration of the metal that you are eating. Um, and that's why when you are eating tuna, they said you should not eat tuna more than once a week. Um, because the concentrations of heavy metals are likely to be higher in that fish because it is it can be a very large fish. Right. Okay. And we have a question from Karanique Dicias. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. How do you mitigate um, during extreme events? How do you mitigate against food deserts during extreme events if people don't have access to healthy food, both physically and financially? Um, that was some of the, um, uh, the, the things that I skipped through as in providing funds. But I mean, if the food is not there, the food is not there. Um, and that's an issue that um, governments would have to address. 
one of the problems in the Caribbean is we are so heavily dependent on importing food um, and we have not um, stressed enough the fact that we need to grow our own food and it needs to start with your backyard or your balcony or with your little pot in your house. Start somewhere. Right. We have a question from Sally Ang. Uh, the changes in rainfall patterns, right, because of the changes in rainfall patterns and greater flooding events, do we take that into consideration when we are doing city planning and building codes? Do you know anything about that? Um, they are supposed to, um, but things get passed. They are supposed to, it's like, um, I know there was, there's one area, where is that? Um, this is a drain and somebody lives at the end of this drain and it's two drains coming into this one place. And whenever it rains, his house, his house floods out because he's at that intersection of those two drains joining. And those drains were planned and the house was planned. And both of them got passed. So, but it's supposed to be part of the planning process. Dr. Hospitalis, I see you are on. Is there anything you want to add? Thanks, uh, Lauren. Thanks, uh, Dr. Poon King. I was thinking back to the question of, of, of uh, portable water how to improve portable water right after a flood or major event. Uh, and many countries would distribute chlorine tablets for yeah. residents to be able to treat their water. If you have uh, facilities, you could boil water as well to minimize uh, contamination of the water. That's uh, some practical tips. Yeah, they also have, um, for those who only have bleach, but you have to be very careful. <laughs> Um, and that's why they don't um, make that widely known because it's a last resort because you end up with people taking too much and then it causes another problem. Um, and so that's why they prefer people to use the tablets. Certainly um, in Guyana, when cholera struck years ago, I was involved in a case control study there and uh, people who reported putting a, a cap full of bleach into a bucket of water for drinking uh, had a lot less episodes of cholera um, than those who were just using the water untreated. So that's another practical tip, but you can't put too much. You have to follow the instructions. Okay, great. And we have a question from Arthur Pear. So he's saying that in the Caribbean, after an extreme event, a lot of people will actually turn to the sea to get their food, so you know, fishing. Um, but without refrigeration, they will dehydrate their catches or use salt for as a preservation method. Uh, do you know if this preservation method can assist or hinder the prevention of some of the diseases that we talked about tonight? Well, I know the, the preservation of um, food with salt, it, that's a known practice. I mean, from, I don't know how long you, I don't know, is it in the Bible, James? Uh, yeah, yeah. Of Preservation with salt goes way back uh, thousands of years to reduce the contamination in food. Um, and before re refrigeration, that was a major way of preserving food. That's right. how a lot of the, um, a lot of our food, um, like, you know, we have a lot salt fish, we have salt, um, a lot of our food, um, comes from that history of how, I mean, it's not salt, salt is a different kind of salt. Right. And so we just have a question here. How does drought, can you tell us more about the relationship between drought and the incidence of food and waterborne illness in the Caribbean? So how does drought actually cause the food and waterborne illness? Oh, that was in that slide that I, I went through. Um, I mean, 
I wouldn't try to put it back up. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> that, that might stretch my capacity. Um, uh, but that was the um, slide that linked all the, um, so the slide on waterborne related disease, climate and risk. Um, uh, in drought, what you end up having is um, concentration of pathogens, um, uh, challenges for water treatment, and um, it can be less efficient. So you ended up end up with an increased risk for um, uh, microbial um, exposure. And then uh, you can have changes in water sources as well um, with insufficient treatment options. Um, and then you end up with increased risk. That's just two of the ones that um, uh, were identified in this slide. Let me see if this one, waterborne. Storms, storms, temperature, salinity. Um, I can, I can look in. I can, I can add that to this um, a, a bit more detail to the final slide set. Um, and so I can answer it there. Sure, no problem. That'd be great. And. Do you have any tips on or advice for how a community can monitor or protect their surface waters after heavy rains? That's a difficult one because, I mean, heavy rains, you don't know what's going to happen if your system has been compromised. Um, I don't know, James, you have any ideas? That is challenging. I think people need to be educated about the risk of surface waters after heavy rain. Uh, some of the points we talked about earlier to sterilize or disinfect the water to avoid uh, a food border list or water border list would be some of the points. Monitoring, if monitoring is is there to be able to test surface right. waters. Uh, if it's you're talking about a beach or a lake and it's just recently been flooded, advising people not to bathe there not to recreate there until things, uh, until the flooding subsides. Great, great, thanks. And the surveillance of waters, um, as in um, that has been increasing um, in different countries, different countries do it to different degrees. Right. And a general question um, to the panel, can rising temperatures cause any increased rates of antimicrobial resistance in pathogenic bacteria? Mm. Any thoughts, um, Dr. Booking? Are you on, I'm not hearing you? Yes, I'm, I'm mumbling to myself. <laughs> uh, Dr. Hospital, it's, it's I said that's a tough one. <laughs> because um, uh, you always have issues with antimicrobial resistance. I'm not sure whether the stress of um, climate, uh, stress from climate um, is a trigger. It's a good question, tough one. I would have to look into that. I hope somebody's documenting this because I am trying to answer the questions. I'm not writing. No, we, we do have the questions and um, perhaps next in next week's session, I think maybe we'll learn some more about that as well. A couple of studies from the Food and Agriculture Organization indicating that increasing temperatures do stimulate uh, increased antimicrobial resistance in foodborne pathogens. No, it changes it. I, I didn't know that it um, increased it. No, it changed. It can change it. Perhaps we can um, just provide links to some of those studies, maybe for next week's mm. session as well, Dr. Hospitalis. Dr. Henry has her head up. Yes, I see Dr. Henry. Yeah, my job is always to remind people, please fill out the link in the chat if you want CMEs. And it's only active for two hours after the session is finished. So please, please, please fill out the link. It's in the chat right now. Great, thank you. Thank you, Paula, for reminding us. If you want CME credits, um, please fill out the link. 
and um, submit that. As she said, it's open for the next two hours. So I think that brings us to the end of this session. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Poon King for taking your time today to talk to us about food and water related illness. The recording and um, slide deck will be available on the website um, for your viewing and will be emailed out as well. So thank you very much everyone for joining us today. Have a good evening and we will see you all next week. Bye everyone. Bye. Have a good evening. Oh, see you next okay. week. Now. Take care.